Kelly, Mr. Bant. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Narev, Mr. Corman. Can you? Um, uh, I noticed that in your most recent um, climate-related policy that's available on your website, you um, talk. You make it clear that you've updated your internal business policy based on um, the two-degree target that's been entered into at Paris. And um, that's also something that's grabbed the attention of APRA. And Mr Summer Hayes has given uh, a, a detailed speech about that in February 2017. I just want to focus on what's changed within the bank as a result specifically of two degrees. Um, have you, have you read Mr Summer Hayes' speech? Uh, I haven't read it in full, but I've, I've seen summaries of it. One of the, I mean, he makes it clear that um, you can't uh, sign up to two degrees without also having the idea of a carbon budget. Um, so there's only a certain amount of fossil fuel that can be left, uh, can be burnt in order to us, uh, for us to stay below that two degrees. Do you agree with that conceptually? Yeah, like I think um, the two degrees commitment, uh, from our perspective, what it means is that we're acknowledging the impact of the environment on the, uh, on the well-being of everybody and therefore on our business. And as we think about our policies and processes, we need to not see a certain point in time set and forget. But it's a dynamic process that we have to keep, um, keep reviewing and keep looking at, and we're doing that. But do, you, but do you think that that, do you agree with the idea that, um, Mr Summerhay says there's 25 years of business as usual left. There's, uh, I think he says there's 800 gigatons of CO2. And I mean, you report on your CO2 and your lending exposure of CO2, so you're familiar with all of this. Um, do you agree with his assessment that there's a carbon budget to stay below two degrees? And if so, what do you think it is? Uh, I, I don't have a view on what the carbon budget might be. Uh, what I do have a uh, view is, is that in looking at the sorts of things we've talked about, which is our own emissions, the emissions of our lending book, the application of the equator principles, our ESG lending principles, we need to be factoring in the impact of climate change, and we need to understand that that moves over time. I, I don't profess to have an expert view on a carbon budget. Well, one of the things that you say in your policy and that um, Mr Summerhays refers to is that a consequence of that carbon budget might be that there's what's called stranded assets. So there might be some coal that has to stay in the ground. We just can't dig it up and burn it. Or there might be some gas that has to stay where it is. We can't dig it up and burn it. Um, and you say in your policies that you're making an assessment of whether you're exposed to any stranded assets. I'm just interested, after having signed up now to two degrees, have you identified within the bank any potential stranded assets? Look, we, we look at these sorts of things on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, I, I think Mr Summerhays uh, has obviously taken a very detailed view. You'll be aware that there remain others with different views about how long assets relying on certain fuel are going to survive. Um, when we are looking at any particular lending decision or lending exposure, we are absolutely taking a view on the sustainability of the counterparty, as we are, frankly, uh, with any counterparty whom we lend to. But, but if, you'd, if, you'd, if, there was, if the bank had said, we agree um, that there, with the global treaty that says there should be no more asbestos, you'd go through and review your loan books to work out whether you um, were subsidising or loaning or financing asbestos um, companies and then work out whether that meant that you had an exposure and whether um, items in those companies that might currently be on the asset side of the balance sheet needed to be transferred over to the liability side. Um, I'm surprised to hear that you, you talk about it being an ongoing process for new investment. I'm surprised that um, having changed your policy to accept two degrees and accepting everything that comes with that, you haven't gone then done a review to work out whether you're exposed to any stranded assets on your current loan book? Well, I think what Mr Summerhays also said, and this is very important, is that it's incumbent upon boards to assess this risk uh, and to make sure that policies and, and practices... So, have you, so having, having now signed up in your bank's policies to two degrees, putting it on your website and making it very, very clear that you understand that the public takes this seriously and that your reputation matters and that that's one of the reasons that you're doing this, have you, since doing that, done a review of your loan book to work out whether the bank is exposed at all to any potential stranded assets? I don't think it's as simple as classing an asset as stranded or not. Um, there's a lot of judgment is to be that applied. A, is that a no? Is that, a, have, is that, have you done a review since changing your policy 
to accept two degrees, have you done a review to determine whether the bank is exposed? Or, we are constantly loan? reviewing the sustainability of all our exposures. Can, but it should be a yes or no question. Have you done a review to work out, given that you've changed your environment policy, you've put it up on your website, have you done a review to work out whether you've currently got any exposures? Well, I come back to the point of saying our client teams responsible for individual loans are constantly assessing this and many other factors and looking at the board. So has there been a directive from the board level or anywhere down to say, given we've just done this, go back and reassess, we want your every individual, we want the, the people who are responsible to go back and reassess current exposure? There, there doesn't need to be because these sorts of reviews are a matter of common practice of okay. which this is one factor. So has there been any... Can you point me to one uh, loan or form of financing that's been identified since you've entered, it, since you've changed your policy, that suggests you might have an exposure? What I can tell you, because you, you'll appreciate, I won't get into individual cases. That there have been loans which we have decided not to take or not to renew solely on the basis that they don't comply with our own. Uh, policies and processes regarding uh, ESG and the equator principles. But, and specifically two degrees? In, in, through those policies, yes. And so without identifying um, names, can you give me an example of the type of project that you might have refused? Well, look, in terms, you know, our exposure to renewables, I think at the moment, is about five times our exposure to coal, just to put this in, and our exposure to renewables is about $2.3 billion. Yep. Um, this is not a very significant part of our book. Um, we are taking a view on every individual name, name by name, and just seeing whether or not we believe the business is sustainable. Not, but we're not doing it from any top-down labelling as to whether something is stranded no, or not, because I you, just don't believe just that's given, doable. But you've just told the committee that um, there are some uh, types of projects that you've not lent to as a result of changing your policy? I'm no, as a result of the application of the equator principles, now ESG in, principles. And I asked including two degrees, and no, you no, said... I, no, no, I asked including two degrees, and you said yes. I have said that is the overall environmental okay, so policy... there is not one single example that you can point to since you've changed your policy to accept the implications of a Paris Agreement where the bank has refused to loan to someone. Well, it's not what I said, and I don't think you're actually giving well, me the chance give me to answer the question. Can you give me an example, then? Without I have said, identifying people if you're concerned about I have that. said, and I'll just repeat it again, that we've got very transparent principles relating to the equator principles and ESG, which we apply. They're consistent with our overall posture relating to the environment. And the application of those principles has been a sole reason why an otherwise viable loan has not been made or has not been rolled over. And can you, in connection with uh, climate and two degrees, can you give me an example of that without identifying No, I'm not going to go into any other specific examples of that simply because I, I don't want to run the risk of people linking it to specific client activity, which would not be appropriate for me to talk about. Do you um, consider, uh, either as part of a review of existing loan book or when granting new mortgage applications, do you consider the impact of potential sea level rise on property values? Uh, not specifically that I'm aware of at this stage. Why, why not? I mean, you talk about the... Uh, your policy talks about the physical impacts of climate change and the potential exposure to the bank's loan books. People are talking about sea level rises and the impact on homes um, in Australia in low-lying areas. Um, why don't you take that into account? You know, we, we as I mentioned before, uh, look at the... As climate change in our overall um, environment is an important factor into what we take into account. We're a bank that people rely on for uncertainty. Uh, we're still in an environment where even in our political environments, people cannot agree on what the appropriate policies might be relating to the environment uh, within, within, our, within our policy makers. And in that circumstance, you'll appreciate that as a major bank, it's very difficult for us to be the instrument of implementing climate policy despite the fact that we have on the record been very clear about our concerns about environmental sustainability. But, I, but, I, but I'm asking about the... Um, I mean, you've made it clear in your bank's state, public statements that there are physical impacts of climate change, that's the science, and you accept that, um, that uh, would impact on agriculture in Australia, and your bank's policies say that you take that into account. So in terms of what it might mean for declining productivity and the like, um, there's a whole section of that in your policy. I'm just, I'm just asking whether um, 
it might be sensible to do that with respect to housing as well. I can imagine the inquiries we would have in front of this committee next time if some of your constituents have said that we've refused to provide them with mortgage financing solely on the basis of our perception that rising sea levels might make their homes not viable. I think they would be asking why have they been not given clearer guidance of that by policy makers if that's such an important factor that we would refuse to lend against it. You'd, can, you'd take into account lending to a business or a household if it was in a bushfire zone, wouldn't you? Uh, we lend to if houses... It didn't, if it didn't meet appropriate standards. We, we lend to houses right across uh, bushfire zones. And again, if we weren't to do that, I think you'd be hearing a lot of different conversations around this committee. Do you um, have an exposure to the uh, Abbott Point Terminal and the Adani Coal Mine? Do you have financial interest in that? Uh, we've been very clear. Historically, uh, we have been involved and we had a particular relationship with Adani, which I think uh, was discontinued by mutual agreement going back a couple of years. Do you currently have an exposure with respect to the Upper Point Terminal? Uh, I think we still have a historic exposure. And do you consider that the um, uh, development of the coal mine, given that I'm taking from what you're saying that you currently don't have an exposure or a relationship with the Adani coal mine, is that as opposed no, to No, we have terminal? had a historic, we have had a historic relationship. Um, there was a particular uh, advisory relationship which was terminated again quite clearly. I, I can't remember exactly when it was. I think it's going back a couple of years now. And do you, from the perspective of your um, historical exposure to the Abbott Point Terminal, as distinct from, a, from the coal mine itself, um, do you think that uh, you're exposed there, given that many people are saying that um, you can't dig up the coal that's in the Adani Carmichael coal mine consistent with two degrees? Uh, I wouldn't be able to give you a considered answer to that question at the moment. Last, my, my last question. Um, uh, I got a yes, no answer from the head of NAB. I'm wondering if you'll give me the same. Do you think houses in Melbourne and Sydney are overpriced? Uh, well, I read the transcript and I don't think the yes, no question was that quick. Um, but I would say that we understand the, the laws of supply and demand in the whole sector, and I think the view on is any given house overpriced or not, I'm not going to pronounce on that. We obviously are lending at levels uh, we're comfortable with uh, in terms of all parts of Australia. There, there are, and I'll finish on this, Chair. There are a lot of people, especially young people, who think that houses in Sydney and Melbourne are overpriced. Do you share that view? Uh, I'm not sure that they're saying it's overpriced. I think they're saying it's difficult to afford it, and we share that view. And to what I said before, that should be a matter of national concern, and it certainly is to us. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Bant. Mr. Hogan. Thank you, Chair.